Hello and welcome to the New York Jewish Film Festival. Uh, the festival is presented by the Jewish Museum and Film at Lincoln Center annually in January. I'm Indigo Sparks, a member of the selection committee, and I am so excited to welcome you to this discussion of Tiger Within. Uh, I'm here with the director, Rafael Zelinsky, and the writer, Gina Wincos. First of all, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank well, you for having sure. us. Thank you so much for having us and uh, for watching the film. It's a real honor. You know, uh, small, smaller independent films don't get as much exposure as we hope they do. So we're very honored that you watch the film. Of course, I, I found it to be very endearing and shocking uh, and relatable in surprising ways. Um, so maybe you guys could start by telling us how you decided to create the film, um, what kind of drew you to tell this story, like how it all came together. Yes, I, I, I read the script, um, Gina gave me the script because we have a background. We had, we had done a previous film that was at Sundance that it directed that Gina wrote. So we were friends and she gave the script into my lap and I was so touched by the script and, and um, have tried to make it for many years and it's gone through many incarnations. But what attracted me to the script, you know, apart from the wonderful writing and the amazing, you know, uh, development of the two characters and all the emotion and the wisdom and the truth in the script, what attracted me was the idea of forgiveness. And I, you know, I researched the subject matter quite extensively by talking to a lot of people from all kinds of backgrounds, religions, philosophers, philosophers, you know, um, intellectuals. And um, what's so beautiful about this story is that, you know, Samuel gives a compassionate forgiveness to this girl. He has a lot of anger and pain and poison that he carries. And, you know, forgiveness is very medicinal and a lot of people practice it for almost selfish reasons to cure themselves. He goes beyond that. He reaches out to this girl and he understands her. He understands that you know, like a lot of people in this country and across the world, we haven't, you know, had the luxury of being exposed to a lot of cultures, history, you know, we, a lot of people have come from very limited backgrounds, very narrow backgrounds. And that doesn't make them bad human beings. It's just that they haven't had the, the luck or the parents or the, whether it's the spirituality or religion or parents injecting this into them or, you know, or, or history or, or philosophy or psychology, they just haven't had those gifts given to them. So they are, you know, stuck in a very narrow view. And that's how a lot of this hatred and, you know, racial division breeds. And, and he sees this, he understands this girl, he understands her parents and he rises above it. And as well as trying to heal himself, he reaches out unconditionally to her. And I think that's the beginning of how humanity should be working. You know, if we start, you know, reaching out in a deeper way, you know, then I think the world hopefully will be a better place. And such horrors as the Holocaust won't ever happen again. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, so as viewers, um, you know, we're kind of subtly introduced to Samuel, right, before before Casey is. Um, so I'm curious about why you kind of chose to introduce him in that way. Gina. Well, it's, it's mostly, it's the transformation comes from Casey. Uh, she impacts Samuel, but when we need to see how broken the child is and we all know as as viewers that a child that angry is just going to grow up to be more hateful unless there's some sort of stopgap and Samuel's that stopgap but we need to I, I felt that I had to draw Casey as the not that she is a stupid person, but she acts stupid and she's stupid from a lack of education and a lack of interaction. I mean, that's the thing about New Yorkers. There's so many cultures there 
that we are forced to interact with. I mean, I'm a New Yorker that we don't I never experienced anti-Semitism in New York ever. And, I, you know, I am because we are more sophisticated by being in a room with all the different voices and all the different languages. And um, and we see them as our equals. I mean, hopefully we do. Um, there's other parts of the world, I mean, other parts of the country, you know, which they call the flyover, but nonetheless, those people don't, they haven't met. I mean, I, my ex-husband's mother had never met a Jew. So, I mean, and they're in Pennsylvania. So, you know, when they don't meet people and recognize other faiths, races, behaviors as human, they, we become very distant to them. And so I needed to show Casey as coming from that um, abyss of just ignorance. And ignorance can be cured. And just by, um, by somebody that is willing to take the hate, because she is hateful. And most people, when they come across somebody that hateful, it's just... It, who wants to take the time? They're like, like life is hard enough. Who wants to deal? And um, he deals and he deals for his own reasons. And um, that's why Samuel comes in later, because we need to be invested in Casey uh, as a story to see that her transformation is genuine. Yeah. And Casey hasn't like, it's very, it was very evident to me. Right. And I, that she hasn't experienced a lot of kindness either no. right mm -hmm. like hate begets, begets hate um oh, yeah. and 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 so she you know we don't we don't really see any of of that behavior around her and samuel teaches her a number of things you know kindness for kindness sake um the importance of self-love and self-respect um he never tries to make a fool of her mm -hmm. uh even throughout her her ignorance uh, and hateful behavior, but you know, it's such a delicate balance that I felt <laughs> watching the two of them interact um, on screen. Like at some point you kind of feel, you know, okay, at some point he's just gonna get sick and tired of this little girl throwing right. all this, you know, a mess at him. Um, but what was it like, you know, I, I feel that Margot and Ed did so amazing and I'm curious about what it was like to work with them and, and playing that balancing act. Margo was 14, first of all, you know, and she um, she she had her, her own history. And she was at that age when we met her where she was just beginning to experience life outside of school a tiny bit. And she had questions and she really I, I mean, this this opened her eyes. She had you know, they don't teach that much in school anymore about all these horrors. I mean, it's covered maybe minimally, but she on her own researched it and she was like on set, she'd say, really, they did that? Really, they did that? And, you know, it, it was um, a lot of kids that, you know, first of all, I've met kids that don't even believe it happened. So that's what fascinated me the most. And that exactly what you said, where that, and he almost got there, that breakfast scene, which is my favorite scene, where he almost lost it when he told her her mother is wrong. Because even though, you know, even though she and she and her mother are at odds on probably everything, there's still that little girl in her that believes mama and mama is wrong, you know? And, and that's the first time I think that, that, and that shows Ed's gift that he was able to still not be hateful towards her but just go, oh my God, this child, you know? So yeah, that he, that's the closest he came to just wanting to smash her, but he didn't. And also, you know, as a director, I, I, I come from a documentary background and I, I made sure that on this film, I would sort of stand back and wouldn't over, over direct them, let them flow very naturally. And they are very, they are, they're almost like the two real things, you know I mean? Uh, you know, Ed has family who di who died in the Holocaust. She's, you know, co a complete newcomer, never, didn't even know very much about the Holocaust, very little. And she was the real thing. So it was like capturing two real things, you know, two real 
people who are just the characters very much and and not over manipulating the performance, not over staging it in a mannered way. You know, I was I I come from the cinema verite film school run by Richard Leacock when I was at MIT and him and Penny Baker, you know, started this whole cinema verite movement. And he told told me, you know, you gotta be like a fly in the corner of the room. That's what you are as a filmmaker. And that's that's how you get the best life, the reality happening in front of your camera. So I was trying to apply that very much. And also, you know, we had to work super fast because this was an ultra low budget film. And also we were working with 14 year old child performer. So there were a lot of lows we had to follow. We could only work five hours with her. So we had to work super fast and there was very little rehearsal time. So we just like let it flow, you know, very often and captured the moment. And I think that's the strength of, you know, what we got. Uh, well, I felt um, watching it like it was, uh, it did come across very naturalistic to me. Um, I don't know if I was feeling connected to Casey's like 14 year old angst or <laughs> like thinking back to arguments I've had with my mother or, you know, just coming from a place of just genuinely not understanding and thinking you have it all figured out. Like that's that age, right? You're kind of starting mm -hmm. to take that, that, that turn. Um, but in the film, there were a few she has these like really specific moments of joy that spark for her a little bit or where she kind of starts to come alive, right? And the first one that I noticed uh, was actually when she removed the swastika, when she painted over the swastika over the coat and she came back in and she was like, mm -hmm. see, you know, like, like, look at me. I was like, oh, okay. And then, you know, and then to moments that she kind of, there are a few moments she has with Tony when she's experiencing consent and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and care. All right. And, and uh, moving slow. Um, but one in particular that stood out to me was when her interest in the photographer, mm -hmm. um, Diane Arbos, mm -hmm. I believe it is. Arbus, um, yeah. And Arbus. Yes. And so she, that's kind of the first topic. I, it seems, you know, that as far as school is concerned, where she's like, hmm, like, right. let me let me take an interest in this person. Um, and she's an American photographer. I, so I'm curious if you could expand on just like the significance of that connection. Well, I, I think that, first of all, you, the, the scene you bring up with the swastika is, was powerful for me because it was the first moment that she crossed the bridge to Samuel that she gave. And in order to give, mm -hmm. you know, once you give anything, it's you're vulnerable. And it was the first time that she yeah. had empathy towards somebody else's feelings because she was so hard. And um, and sh those kids become hard because their feelings are so are so ignored. And so uh, slowly by slowly she becomes more curious about the world around her and realizes, of course, that it's a bigger world than than the spite that she grew up in and the fear. I mean, you know, the fear and the hatred comes from this limited viewpoint of everybody's against me. And um, once she realizes maybe everybody isn't against me, she starts to find value in other people other people, including obviously Ed, I mean, Samuel, his, his viewpoint on life, his philosophy, and, and looking at these photographs and realizing that people that are not presented as perfect have value. And it gave her a sense of, hmm, okay, um, there's a world out there that I might belong to. Right. And, and I was attracted, you know, with the, to, to um, Diane Arbus's work because, you know, all the films I've done always seem to be about misfits and rebels and outsiders. And maybe I find myself a little bit of that. And, uh, you know, so I think, you know, that touched me. And I think the fact that, you know, she sees herself as a misfit too, and she realizes that there is value in her through the, you know, this wonderful photographer's work who had a very, traveled you know life i mean she committed suicide so um yeah. you know there is a connection there um you know which which was 
I think deeper and on ma many levels interesting to explore. Yeah. Um, so Casey, she is, she has found herself on the outside. She has considered herself to be the ugly duckling, like self-labeled mm -hmm. herself that she mm -hmm. is moving to that beat. Um, and when, you know, she does open herself up to Samuel and become vulnerable. Um, I think as a viewer, ah, oh, she's like made it, right? She's found the home. She understands mm -hmm. the importance and the value of chosen family. She understands that it doesn't have to be one way. And then you guys like rip our heart out. <laughs> and Samuel is, you know, a, a victim of an experience that a lot of people go through, a hate crime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, you, my heart was very much, I was very shocked at that um, and uh, very, you know, upset about that whole experience for his sake uh, and for Casey's sake. Um, I guess she, I was feeling she had already been through so much, right? So why is it, why was it necessary for her to experience this loss? Well, I think it was, I mean, dramatically it was because it's one thing to have ugly beliefs and it's a whole other thing to see the result of the ugly beliefs. And she sees those results by these maniacs, you know, fostered on a man. She is the only person that has chosen to love her. And he has chosen to do so, Samuel. And um, and she says at some point that could have been me doing the banging. And when she realizes, I think it's twofold. One is, oh my, somebody I adore is a victim of this. And then on the more internal side, she's like, I, all the, the ugly thoughts that I had and all the people I know that have done equally horrible things, I'm part of that cycle and how easily I could have been the perpetrator, not caring about the victim. And I think once, once that, that horror affects you directly, it, 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 it's very grave on your soul. And um, aside from, you know, hurting somebody that you care deeply for. Yeah, and I think it's very relevant, you know, to what's going on in this country because, it, I mean, we there's a lot of issues, you know, r race, guns, you know, politics, and we we sort of see it theoretically, we're detached from it, but then it hits us for real. And we are opened up and we realize that, you know, our beliefs may be a very you know, they're formulaic, they're not true beliefs, you know, we truly don't get it, you know, and it's a wake up call. So I think it was a good dramatic device, you know, in the script that was necessary for the audience to experience that. Because, you know, in drama, I look at Shakespeare, I mean, you need to see, you know, murder, death, violence, you need all those elements to wake human beings up so they can relate and grow and learn, you know, and you know, there's too, in film, there's too many films where we are, we sort of get very detached and are not really, you know, involved in them. And when we leave them, they, we, we forget them really fast. So to make a film somehow grow on you and leave, leave something with you, you need some strong dram dramatic, um, you know, turns in the story. And I think Gina did that exactly correctly. It's, it was necessary for the story to have the power that it does. And unfortunately, you know, it's Ed um, passed away. It was almost like, you know, it was strange it was filming that scene, you know, there was, and filming that hospital scene, you know, we felt, I mean, when I was filming that scene, I felt, you know, this is gonna happen and could happen quite soon. You know, there was a sort of a melancholy feeling of filming that scene. And we're very sad to, you know, to have him go because I, I wish for him to have been part of this. I mean, he cared so much about this film. He gave it so much 
you know, love and time. And he really believed in the message of the film, you know. I mean, he did it for, I mean, it wasn't about money. There was very little money. He really believed in this film and its message. Wow. Yeah, and I mean, I think the overall message too of, right, like courage and empathy and love and no fear, right, until the very end. Um, it, it was a part of the film that made me realize like, oh, right, <laughs> of course, like this is life, right? This is what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and when you are a part of a marginalized group, right, you, you can find yourselves in these situations and even the most caring and empathetic and loving, right, person can find themselves in, in this place. So it was, it was very powerful. Um, yeah, it's not impervious just because he has his own internal um, adjustment, a, a new view on how to get rid of the anger. I mean, I think it also came from, I, if I were in the Holocaust, I don't think I could ever forgive. That's just not my nature. I don't think yeah. I ever could. And I don't know that he, I mean, Raphael's bigger on the forgiveness element than I am. For me, it wasn't that he forgave as much as he promised his wife he would learn not to hate everybody. And I, I, I don't know that I ever would be able to open up enough when he saw what he saw in the cemetery and has that turnaround of like, I'm going to go back there. I mean, it's, it, it, I can't even imagine, sit, like when I see kids, you know, and they're just like, you know, they don't even know what they're talking about or, you know, they're wearing Doc Martens. They don't know what that represents. It still is very offensive to me, you know, mm -hmm. and it's uh, as much as I think they're cool looking shoes. I know what they stand for and it bothers me. And so for him to be able to turn around, having seen that image, there was something that pulled him. Was it curiosity? Was it the promise he made? I, it's 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 layered for why yeah. he turned around and to hold in the contempt to say, "Look who's sleeping here," you know. Whereas my my soul, I feel like, what would keep me from kicking this kid? You know, mm -hmm. while she's, it's like it's that battle of you want to rise above your own venom. And, um, and, you know, in our higher self, yeah, it'd be great to be able to be Ed or to be Samuel and sit on the rock and, mm -hmm. and disassociate from the horror. To well, go yeah, I think you've made place. a very good point, uh, layered. I think, you know, that's why the, I think this, this script and the movies has power because it's layered and every audience member can see it to a, to a different level or a different aspect of it. But ultimately, it has, you know, this beautiful enlightening message, which I think will leave people with more light than they came in. Yeah, because he doesn't, he doesn't weaponize any of his experience. Um, he doesn't, you know what I mean? He doesn't, he doesn't weaponize it. And he's, no, he's he battling, he you know, like, it to be like, oh, the world's been bad to me, you know? Right. No. no. Right. He right. carries it deep inside. And especially yeah. the scene where he goes to visit her parents, you know, he's very restrained yeah. and, and un, you know, compassionate. He could blow up. I mean, you know, he could have just, uh, you know, attacked that guy, you know, the, the boyfriend. I mean, like, he could have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. And that's that was powerful. my urge. So. Yeah, no, that I mean, you know, <laughs> both of us, you and I, we're both in the minority group. I mean, people are going to see you and they're going to be careful not to say whatever if they have evil in their heart. But it's a lot of, not, I'm not going to say a lot of times, but it has happened because they don't think or they don't know I'm Jewish and they'll say something in front of me. And because it's not as obvious, you know, and you just go, okay, what should I do? Do I blow this dinner up? You know, 
uh, or wherever it is. And it's, they think it's like a small thing. Like they'll say something like, yeah, I went and looked at refrigerators, you know, I tried to chew them down, but I, you know, I ended up paying more than I wanted to, you know, something that they think is so mild and you go, yeah. all right. Okay, what, how do I respond? And that's just part of the language that's out there. And yeah. that has to be, um, that, that has to be confronted. Well, there is another layer uh, to the film, um, the illustrations. Um, they were so touching and unex an unexpected thread, right, throughout the story for me. Um, so could you talk about, uh, you know, kind of how you came to that decision to include sure, yeah, them? And, yeah, actually, you know. it was strange because, you know, this happened very spontaneously halfway through the film. <laughs> we were filming a scene and the costume wardrobe assistant was sitting in the corner in between takes, sort of writing in a little diary. And I glanced at the diary and there was this amazing drawing. And I said, wow, this is so interesting. Can I flip through it? Can I have your permission? And it, with, I flipped away, it was like Casey's diary, you know, with all these sort of angry faces and many colors of a self portraits and all kinds of poetry and very heartfelt feelings, you know. And I said, well, can we incorporate this into the movie? It's, it's still not too late. So we, we hadn't filmed the, the big scenes like in her bedroom. So we then started uh, coming up with the idea that she's an artist, you know, that's what her her natural talent is, and we populated her bedroom with these drawings, and then we started incorporating them, you know, whatever scenes were left to do. And, um, and especially in the, in the zoo scene, you know, she, 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 we sent her to do a, a drawing of the tiger, and she did that like two hours before we filmed this scene. So uh, we commissioned her to do more and more drawings. And then my wife, who is an artist, um, it took this to another level and she, after, as we were editing, she created like a few hundred drawings Then we started sprinkling over the movie and it gave the movie like a whole different layer where we go inside the heart and soul of Casey, which I think was, was nice because it gives her more depth, you know, we, more, we understand her more. Um, you know, because we don't, we didn't want to use voiceovers and the scenes are very short and quick. So somehow, you know, seeing her angry drawings just expressed her feelings to a much more deeper way than the limited time that a movie allows you to do that. It, it, like in a novel, you know, where you can go into a, a whole, you know, inner monologue. This was our mm -hmm. version of her sort of inner monologue. Uh, it was, I enjoyed them so much. It, I um, like the butterflies and, you know, I, I just, it felt, um, yeah, it was, it was that vulnerability aspect of her um, and the self portraits in particular, I found to be really uh, poignant because she is discovering, she's on that self-discovery, but we're always on that, but, you know, mm -hmm. at her age, she's, she's on that mm -hmm. path of self-discovery and she's, literally on a path of self-discovery as she's she journeying to a new place and meeting new people and who am I in the midst of all of this um, right so and, and those, you know and those drawings looked very much like the actress you know that was interesting the her name was Clara the costume assistant and she's oh. she looked a little bit like Casey and her self-portrait looked like Casey so that mm -hmm. was a, a magical um, accident Um, so, oh, can we talk about the happy birthday scene at the end, uh, that uh, illustration? Right, yeah, that, well, that, that came after we edited the film and we felt there was something missing, you know, there was one final note missing. So, um, you know, I asked my wife to, to draw this, to show that she, you know, her life, uh, because some people were questioning, well, what's going to happen to her? Did he leave her? you know, right. an allowance, uh, what, is she back on the street? No, you know, it felt it needed a, um, a conclusion to make the film perhaps more mainstream, you know, less of an independent film that leaves you hanging to, to give it more closure and, and make it more of a mainstream, you know, closure ending. So, so I think that yeah. drawing tells it all. And I think I'm so happy we did it in the end. 
we were testing it and it really worked. Yeah. It was that it was that moment of like, oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, like <laughs> I think it gives yeah. a feeling of safety. Yeah. You know, it's not exactly we don't know, does she move in with them? Does she, whatever, because she's got a long road to go with that family, yeah. but the drawing gives us the suggestion that there's been progress there. And also, you know, we were using this wonderful app that uh, I think it's called Brushes, you know, it memorizes your brush strokes. So Bali had to do this drawing like 20 times because she would get it wrong and they had to start all over because you can't <laughs> erase it. I can, uh, it only records every brush stroke going forward. You can't go backwards, but it shows the whole process. So it would be like a two hour it would take a two hours or three hours to do the whole drawing, you know, to outline it and start mm -hmm. coloring in. And if she made a mistake that all had, then she was very frustrated. She had to redo it like a number of times till it worked perfectly. Yeah. But it's a wonderful so, animation so satisfying. tool. And actually <laughs> yeah. David Hockney uses it a lot. So he, he, he's a champion of this app. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so I guess we'll just we'll ask one final question. We'll wrap it up. But what would you say you both have learned from the process of creating this film? Um, just about, you know, yourselves as individuals, as an artist. Um, well, I let me start with that. I wrote it in, um, what was it, 90, 91, something like this when yeah it was just a personal story for me um and i never ever thought that the, america would be what america is today or that i mean i always knew that there were people that were vocal but i about their racism but i never knew that there were so many silent ones that have been allowed to emote and vocalize and proudly state their ignorance and that I did not know back then so I what I'm so delighted with is that people have responded to the movie not not just as entertainment which of course as a writer you don't want to ever bore people but realizing like oh this impacts me right now because of the world we're in right now. So for me, that's what I've, what I've gained from doing this movie. I mean, other movies I've done, I've always, I, I love comedy and, you know, and feel good and romance and all that. But this, this hits, it, it, it's a different instrument in the orchestra is how I feel. And for myself, you know, I was, I, I mean, I, it just reinforced the idea that you really have to do some things that matter that uh, you are passionate about. Because I, in my past, I had to make some films I didn't want to make. And I'm very embarrassed that I actually made them. And in the long run, I wish I just hadn't done them at all, you know, rather than not do a movie and not have a career that makes something you don't believe in. So, you know, by doing this film, it sort of, you know, gave me the courage, you know, even if it's very little money, I mean, I, I, I no, none of us got paid. We did it for the love, you know. Let's make more movies that you know are enlightening, illuminating, and and I'm starting a startup called Film Art Planet, and I hope to raise you know private money to make more enlightening, illuminating, micro budget films because life is too short. Yes, well, that's amazing. Thank you both so much well, for joining me for this conversation. We are. Right thrilled to have you guys in the festival this year um, thank you yes and we'll see you later <laughs> thank you so okay. much thank, thank you. you bye bye, -bye.